Hello, my name is John Grant and welcome to another recorded conversation with the Wardley Mapping community. Before I move on to today's guest, I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Daniels. Uh, most people in the Wardley Mapping community will be aware of Chris, so if you don't mind, I'll quickly move on to today's guest, which is Vikesh Shah. Welcome, Vikesh. Hi, thank you. So we're obviously here to talk about Wardley mapping. It's, um, it's just after 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So quickly introduce yourself, Vikesh, and how you've arrived to today to talk about Wardley mapping. Sure. So my name is Vikesh, and I am, well, my title is commercial director right now at a company called Metal. But um, a little bit of quick introduction about Metel. Metel has always been a startup involved in the fashion technology space, specifically about digitizing human bodies and digitizing clothes and finding a way to bring the two together in visual formats so that people can see how a piece of clothing would look like on a real human body, even if they don't physically have that item there to wear. And over the summer we had we were acquired and had a little bit of a pivot at that time to focus on a more nascent area of our business and that more nascent area still involved things which we were doing previously but instead of us creating our own way of digitizing clothes from taking photographs of physical samples we instead were working with existing 3d cad software for the apparel industry. So this was actually beginning to work with other companies who were focusing on a much earlier part of the apparel process than us, the design and the product, product development space. And their software is great for actually true to life simulations of clothes on mannequins or the forms which people would design their clothes for. But this software like kind of typical CAD software requires uh, very powerful computers, graphics cards, all of those traditional things which you would expect with um, high-end CAD systems. So kind of quite expensive, a lot of technical skill required knowledge, um, not a cheap cost per digital garment either as a result of that. However, the benefit of that is it's very, it's as close as you can get to treat life simulation at the moment. And the industry is beginning to acknowledge that it is coming to treat life. So our kind of little pivot had been taking parts of our technology around the body modeling, beginning to work with these other companies for the garment digitization piece, and still finding ways to bring the two together in visual formats for new use cases and applications in the industry. Uh, so my role had been commercial director beforehand, but since we kind of moved into a smaller team format, it's kind of spread into more areas such as uh, more product management, more marketing aspects as well. And during this kind of contraction as well, our CTO previously then became the CEO. So we have now a let's say a CTO biased CEO. And when he was starting to think about the strategy side of our new smaller business, he actually pointed me to Simon Wardley's book. Now, happily, I'd actually seen Simon Wardley present a year before that, I think. And I thought at the time it was great, really interesting, but being open, didn't take any action on it didn't really in retrospect i didn't feel there was so much of a call to action from his presentation i loved it i thought it was really interesting and exciting but there wasn't something which i thought right i must do then and there and he did of course mention his book but i had no idea about how thorough and what a thorough it is and what a great source of information it is so it actually took this summer event happening and my CEO pointing me directly to that book saying he was already on chapter four so I thought all right I better start catching up with him and I guess that was kind of the aha moment for me when 
I started going through the book and could go through more examples, thanks to the book of Wardley Maps, but also just realizing there the, the depth of research and thought that's gone into this. Because I think when people hear about, say, climactic patterns or doctrines, it can sometimes come across, like sometimes in sales, when you're just telling people to do something or telling people something, they kind of have a natural aversion to it or say, well, how do I know it's true? And as soon as I was reading the book, it was like, oh, I understand all of these steps. I understand the thought process that has gone here. I actually agree with all of this. And probably part of the agreeing of it was the fact that we were a larger organization beforehand, which hadn't been sticking to those doctrines. And I could see how those doctrines would have helped us. And it's kind of happy coincidence that we're now at this smaller team size where I think we have the chance to apply lots of these doctrines and actually, as a result, have a better organization going forward. But it would have been very hard to do that previously when we were larger. There would have been even more inertia to that change. So it's kind of a happy coincidence that we've got this smaller team size who's more, more open to new approaches and who I think we all share now a stronger bias to avoiding waste and avoiding duplication in efforts. So a lot of the doctrines already begin to resonate and it means that we actually, we have found um, it being laid out into this great format already, something that we can all, all coalesce around. So I wonder if we could zoom in now Mm -hmm. to talk about Wardley Maps and the journey that you've been on working with a technology partner mm -hmm. or the outsourcing process. Mm. So as you know, I'm no expert in apparel or 3D design software, but I do understand that it can add, it can affect every component within the value mm. chain. Um, so, and maybe talk about how you've had or the experience you've had working with um, partners mm. by using Wardley Maps to improve communications or yeah. uh, and collaboration. Sure. So I think the first place I would start off with is first, you've got to be aligned within your own business as well. And obviously, of course, that's one of the doctrines. And the starting point for us has definitely, well, and for myself personally, has just been around the user needs. And I think if I was to say what's been one of the most helpful starting take, uh, takeaways from the Wardley Maps is, well, are we actually all on the same page about what are the user needs for not only our product, but also for the users of the 3D CAD software as well? Because they're the ones who are going to be using our software because we're in the 3D CAD software, an intermediary. And so just to explain the situation which our company is in, we're in a beta phase right now with approximately 20 of our partner's customers. So we're learning about the business that way. And what we did before kind of starting the beta is actually try to map out who would, well, actually there's several users of our product inside of an apparel brand. So we first had to start pick one, try to zoom into that and then try to think about how their needs um, evolve from there and what are actually the components required to solve that. And I think that's an area where we're still trying to improve upon our own common language and alignment in terms of what are the user needs. But we did get to a place where we could actually start mapping out what was the, what do we think was the state of the apparel industry before any of the 3D CAD software was applied. So this is not taking into account Metal at this point. And the next map was trying to show that evolution when the 3D CAD software was applied. And especially trying to think about how it changed communication flows 
And where was the inertia to this change in communication as well? That was definitely one of the things that we could start seeing from the map. So we built, through, and then we applied and took another map and to start thinking about our own product, which is much more at the genesis or potentially just getting towards the custom built phase and thinking about how does that impact the map? And if, as we evolve our own product, how does that evolve the industry further? So bringing it back to the experience with our partners, that's definitely been more challenging than I hoped, but that's, I think, primarily down to time. And this is maybe one of the things about Wardley Maps in general, that they are a brilliant resource, great tool, but it does require people to invest the time to actually understand it and kind of start having faith in it. So it's some a scenario where I haven't made as much progress as I'd hoped, um, but I did have one interesting um, instance or occurrence which happened just a couple of weeks ago where it was one of our sister companies from the new company who has acquired us. They sent through um, the link about strategy as a service. So when Simon Wardley kind of talks in his presentations about this kind of template and then you can just hit randomize and then it comes through with a strategy. And I saw that and I knew, immediately knew where it was from. So I got quite excited. It's like, oh, oh, have you actually started using Wardley Maps? Great. Like, uh, I'd love to like, but here's some which we've done already. Like, I'd love to talk through it with you. And actually, they, he hadn't, he had read a little bit about Wardley Maps, but he hadn't actually had a go at mapping yet. However, he did actually find the maps which we shared quite useful. Um, but one thing I should just add is that as a starting point for our maps and a starting point to try and help people understand the concept, we actually changed the x-axis. And instead of showing um, visibility or value, in, sorry, not the x-axis, the y-axis, apologies about that. Um, instead of showing the visibility of value, we actually based it around time and the time to actually get the product made. So it was much more of a linear sequence because this is how people have been used to thinking about the apparel industry of somebody designs the product and then another team creates the samples and then what are the steps that go through from that point to then get, doing the mass manufacturing and then getting it through to um, the sales team who then sells to a retailer. So this is an example of where we decided we might get more value at the early stage by doing something slightly different with the map. And this is really just trying to facilitate communication with people who are completely new to Wardley mapping and who we can anticipate would have less time. And the reason I brought it back to this example with the sister company is when I first asked him about Wardley mapping, he shared with me that he had kind of concerns about the value chain aspect of it and where to place things on that axis. And I understand why it's a complex topic. I still haven't got through the community articles about the, the value axis and how to plot things. But he did find the way that we had mapped it very helpful and much easier to understand. So I think for me, this is actually coming back to things which Simon has said that no map is perfect. So don't try to obsess about that. Instead, if you remember that, that this is actually partly a communication tool, then have the, have the bravery and freedom to start changing it if for your particular application that actually it can be more beneficial by changing something in the map. So it's not my intention to keep with this axis, but it's more my intention to use this axis at the beginning when speaking to partners um, or customers who are not yet familiar with mapping, and then maybe start working through with them 
how we could potentially change that access back to the value and visibility side. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the the Y access access does have uh, a number of I wouldn't say issues or contentions, but uh, I think it, maybe Chris can jump in. But it's uh, as far as the framework's concerned, you can get to a point where you can do away with the Y axis altogether, really, the as a, a guide rail. I often say it's a value chain this way up. That's that's what it's for. Now, whether it's visibility or time that you've talked mm -hmm. about. Or, so I think you've, you've hit one of the first common, uh, I don't, I'm trying to find the right word, it's not a problem or an issue. It's kind of a learning, mm -hmm. you've hit a point of the learning curve. Um, Going back then to what I was mentioning earlier, and really this is just to talk a bit more about the application of Wardley mapping in the apparel industry, that 3D design software will impact the, the entire value chain. So, oh, Chris, come in. Chris, yes, yes. I just wanted to say that I, I find the time access actually very valuable because I think it's heavily correlated with the value chain mm -hmm. and because correct me if I'm wrong but when you think about the order of things mm -hmm. it's almost the same as the requirements as the requirement um, I mean the things that are happening earlier are deeper in the value chain the the things that are happening later so they form just kind of a natural order yes an awesome awesome metaphor for telling people how to start uh, with the how to start with mapping and I would be really happy if I could look at such a map and see how this worked in practice yeah absolutely uh, so, so, so this, is, this is this is really awesome modification and the other other thing I've picked up and I would like to hear a little bit more about mm -hmm. was the bit about the inertia because mm -hmm. you mentioned that you've faced it mm -hmm. and you've managed to operate through it and um, if that's not proprietary if this is something you can share mm -hmm. i would be really happy to hear about what was the nature of the inertia and how 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 have you worked around it mm -hmm. this is something that i think the community can heavily benefit from to see and work like work life example of how, how this works in terms of the industry or in terms of how i've been trying to um communicate make use of mapping with our partners for example i think the industry is much more interesting part okay but your partners are also very interesting no so. no 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 because the partner bit is quite simple actually and like the biggest challenge there and the inertia comes down to people's time um and that's the reason why i haven't been able to find time with them to start talking them through the yeah. what i've drawn in depth and um, yeah, I mean, I do have, I can sh happy to share some of the maps which I was just talking about and just give a high level overview of it and just show what I've done differently on the axes, if that's good use of time. Great, okay, give me a second. So let me know if you can all see, great, perfect. So this is the first map which we've created to start introducing this, the landscape of the apparel industry before the introduction of 3D CAD design software. And here is where you can see what I meant about changing the y-axis and again this is just purely because I felt this would facilitate easier communication with people who are not yet familiar with um, Wardley mapping but who are familiar with the apparel industry because they understand this flow of starting from a design to then moving to other people inside of their business to organize the manufacture of a physical sample which then goes across and gets made um, but then there's this approval process of the sample, which actually 
we've learned is very different inside of each company. There's very little standardization around it. It, it does almost feel like a custom built activity each time. And going through to actually, again, creating the final sample um, and then coming through and then starting getting it into the hands of brands who start creating marketing assets in order to then provide the brand's sales team. So when I talk about brands, a good example of this would be the likes of uh, Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, um, Ralph Lauren, because these brands, although they sell directly to consumers, most of their revenue, most of their profit right now is from selling to retailers. So the likes of um, John Lewis, for example, Debenhams, retailers who sell other brands products. So it's mapping out that chain to the retail buyer and which then finally goes to the consumer. And in terms just what this axis therefore on uh, the y-axis was is that point of somebody creating new designs for a new season, going through all of the steps we just described and getting through to something which is called the selling, which is when the brand sells in their products to the retailers and buyers. So we did this as the first map to kind of help people to understand some of these pieces and to really help them to understand, well, manufacturing is commoditized, but a lot of this communication channel challenge happens actually as you start then giving the sample back to a company and they start trying to go through their own approval process, which can be different for different category products um, inside of the business. So it's not even just that it's a different process across companies, but even inside of their own business. And we felt that a lot of this challenge was happening over here as well. But and I think the other thing I would call out at this stage is that it's not as simple as um, 3D software will kind of automatically change the industry because although and the 3D software applies here, and this is where we start talking about the introduction of the 3D software, it starts at a lower down chain, but there's still this physical element here as well. And this is where I'd say a lot of the inertia comes from. So people still need to, are still having to develop trust in this 3D CAD software and their approval process for what clothes to manufacture is based on actually seeing the physical sample, putting it onto either something that's called the fit model, which is human of the right shape, or a mannequin of the right shape and checking that it sits properly. And I think what we kind of were helping, hoping to help people to understand is the 3D CAD software is hopefully helping to productize part of this chain and that there's a lot of inertia behind this. But we also wanted them to understand that you're actually introducing new activities here in order to productionize this and overcome this inertia. So you now need to take um, scans of the fabrics and two types of scans, one which is actually a visual scan, one um, which is the physical properties. So you have to be cognizant that you're asking companies to do a new activity as well as adopt a new, new um, software in order to facilitate their communication flows. So again, it's just trying to help kind of call out assumptions and make sure that people have a chance to challenge any part of this piece. But you can see how from our perspective, we think we feel that it definitely does, the 3D software helps to reduce um, waste and duplication by helping to evolve this area of the map specifically relating to the physical samples because right now if you're not familiar with it what happens often is that brands in the west design their product and then they tell the factory in asia to create a sample wait three weeks for the sample to come over check the physical sample if they realize they want changes they ask the factory to make another sample ship it across the world again check it etc 
But the reason why we're so interested in accelerating the adoption of the 3D CAD software is because actually it allows you to make so many of those changes and checks digitally first. And we still anticipate that the industry for a long time will require at least one physical sample to check. But if we can bring it down from often the five physical samples it is for each design, bring it down to one, then that's already a big win in reducing the duplication and waste. And this is again me just playing out with um, different ways of communicating. So of course these two initial map is quite complicated. So we then created a simpler version to try and help people to understand the message which we were communicating. So show them that we have the detail, but actually then bring it down to a simpler version of the map, which allows us to communicate. This is the main inertia which we see has happened, been happening on the industry. And here you can see the potential benefit and evolution. A little bit of an introduction into our product as well, which, um, which we're doing the beta test with. But then it was onto a map of where do we see our place in this? So it was here where imagining that our product was just moving out of custom built phase into an early stage product and focusing in on helping our partner to understand what are the user needs, which we think we're helping with. And then again, just kind of showing how we think the evolution of 3D and our product can map help with the industry. So I think hopefully that gives a couple of the examples of where we were starting to show to our partners the points of inertia that we anticipated. And actually there is, I should jump onto this point because Photoshop was mentioned, I think um, earlier, and it's something which, well, and it's really more Adobe Illustrator, which is used in the industry. So people are heavily using 2D design tools in um, when manufacturing and designing apparel products. But actually, we see that 3D design tools should replace that. And we were trying to map out the inertia to it and helping companies to understand that actually a lot of this is to do with the components, additional components which are required for 3D design tools, which aren't required for the 2D design. So actually it requires an evolution of those components to help overcome the inertia to moving away from just the 2D design tools. This is, this is amazing. This is amazing. Thank you for, for going through this. No. And, and I, have, I should also just add that one of the things which helped me a lot when doing this was actually joining one of the, I think, is it LEF, right, courses just before the map day. And I would say this is something I wanted to bring up as a recommendation and a tip for anyone who's starting off with mapping. Um, firstly is, of course, just start having a go at drawing your own maps, which is something which I actually did do before that course. But actually that one day course, um, being able to talk with a mixture of people, some who had lots of experience of mapping and then other people who were new to the journey as well. And then being able to start mapping out um, our company and our landscape with them really helped me through this process because it just started bringing up new questions. It meant that we had to, oh, I had to explain the logic behind my positioning of some of these things. There were some challenges, helped me to understand some things which I might not have anticipated beforehand and equally helped me um, to alleviate some of my concerns about, well, should I, have I placed this in the right place? Should it be at a different stage? And being able to ask other people's opinions for it and get feedback. So that is something which I would definitely recommend to people because we had had, I was able to talk about the mapping inside of our own business, but the worry which we had was, hmm, Okay, we've kind of seemed to coalesce around what we think the map should be, but have we just created a new storytelling tool for ourselves? Was the worry. So, I mean, what do we do now? And it's actually Simon 
um, he came along to the end of the course and it was great to see him walking around, looking at each of the maps, asking questions, providing feedback, which I hadn't anticipated, but I found very helpful. And I got to ask him this question about, well, we have this little worry internally that are we just storytelling to ourselves? And he gave a simple explanation about this. It was like, you have now something which you can take to people outside of your company. You can take to your partners and people who are not even familiar with the industry. And you can ask them for their feedback and see what they challenge as well. So it helped me to kind of reassure myself, great, we've got something now that we can go to other people with and see if they challenge the map as well. And every time you open yourself up to challenges, then you're moving away from just falling victim to storytelling to yourself. And that's why I think from, aside from the, the LEF um, course just before the map day, map camp, I think the other thing which I found very helpful was the fact that there is this great community available on Slack as well. So one of the things which I had already done um, was once I created this, I posted it onto the mapping community on Slack into maps in the wild and to start getting feedback and start seeing what questions people are asking as well. So I think I'm very grateful that there is that map camp community, which people can go post their maps, post their questions and get feedback on. Okay, because well, thank you very much for sharing your maps. That's been really interesting. Um, there's a lot I could start to question or ask, but I think we should take that conversation offline and mindful of the time that we've got left. Yep. So that's something that we could do perhaps get in touch with you on Slack. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Definitely. Happy to. Um, so if we turn now to the future mm. um, and think about the, the chat, you've already outlined a number of challenges, um, mm. but in your mind, how do you see yourself moving forward with Wardley Maps to solve some of the problems that you've got? And anything that you think the, um, I mean, you've already made a kind of appeal there, mm. but could you flesh that out the, moving forward and what challenges you envisage in that? Let's see. I'm going to start first with the internal side um, within our own company um, before then to moving on to the external side and how to engage, how we'd like to make use of mapping with people outside of our business. Because I think internally we haven't got it to the point yet where it's embedded in our processes. Um, and I think I mentioned it earlier, but I think one of the key things which I found very valuable about it is just making everyone articulate the users and the user needs. So the starting point, I think, within our own business is trying to get more people inside of the business to create maps, especially coming out of the beta. Start trying to think about, well, now that we've been through this process with 20 different customers, what's your own take on what the map should be? because I found there's been a couple of people within our business who've mapped quite actively and other people have been very helpful at providing feedback on it, challenging it, but not necessarily actually um, taking that step to map themselves. And I think that what the downside of other people not doing it is that it, it doesn't become part of your process and it doesn't become part of this learning tool and like kind of going back to, I, mean, I don't know, every two weeks, every month, it, or something with regular cadence and saying, what's our understanding of the landscape now? Has anything changed based on what we've learned over the last month? Should we change any of these components? So over the next 12 months, I, I'd like to work with our CEO to try and embed that more deeply. So it does become this learning tool rather than just ad hoc create and it's forgotten about. Um, beyond that, it's very much engaging with people outside of um, our own business. So I, in an ideal world, 
um, actually finding a way for it to become a common language with our partners. So I'd, re I'd really like to get their take on the, where we've placed the components. Have we missed something out and actually start making it a tool which we can use to communicate, not just between ourselves, but the, th the partner who we're working with, they are the only 3D CAD software who have opened up APIs to other companies to integrate with. And they are the only company who are promoting what, what they've labeled for their own purposes, the open platform. So if I can get our partner to see the value in it, then hopefully they can use that as a communication tool with all of their partners as well. And then we all have a common language as we're starting to try and help the industry to reduce this waste, reduce the duplication. And that I recognize can be quite challenging just in terms of finding people's time and taking them through this process. So the other thing which I'd like to do in parallel is very much continue being open and transparent and with the MapCamp community. And as you saw from the maps which I shared, I had orientated it around the sales team at a brand. And that was partly because it's a easier place to start off with. But actually, as we start trying to think about the new value change in the apparel industry, it does ultimately revolve around the consumer because <laughs> they're the people who ultimately buy the products. Um, so one of the tasks for me, actually, and um, I haven't had enough time to give it the thought that it will require, is how do we reorientate this map around the consumer? And how does that change the landscape? Because actually that's ultimately where the new value chains um, will be formed, like how we better serve consumers who are buying clothes. So as we start drawing out these new maps orientated around the consumer, that's something where I really want to feed, share them with the mapping community, um, get their feedback. And especially because for people who are not familiar with the ins and outs of the apparel industry, I think it'll be easier for these people to provide feedback and challenges when orientated around the consumer. What are the consumer's user needs? Have you thought about this? Um, and I think there they'll be able to provide even more valuable feedback than they already have done. Earlier, you mentioned that with, with the introduction of 3D software, artifacts about the design, the design patterns will actually travel with uh, up the value chain. So that will kind of reduce waste and improve communication. And I also, I'm also really interested in what you've just said then about Wardley mapping to say, let's have this as a common language. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've talked in the past about Wardley mapping becoming a, it's a, an emerging soft skill. Mm -hmm. Some people agree with it, some people don't, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's something to, to, to talk about. Now, where you are in your journey with Wardley Mapping today, do you think, and, and, and to actually get that point where it does spread, mm -hmm. uh, the uptake of Wardley Mapping into us as kind of a soft skill or a common language, mm -hmm. do you think there are sufficient tools out there to enable that, especially when you're dealing with remote yep. businesses? Or... No. Is pen and paper, pencil and paper enough? I think it's a really good question. And my observation has been, especially kind of coming back to this in the summer and looking at everything again, there is a wealth of information already on the internet about Wardley mapping. Um, but I, I'm not sure about the best way to introduce it to people when, when you might only have, say, 10... 15 minutes with them to, to bring up the topic. And I think this might be part of the challenge, um, especially because people learn in different ways or take in information in different ways. Some people prefer to read, some people prefer to hear, some people prefer to see. So in my mind, I was wondering if, if there was a place where people could go to to know, well, if you've only got a five minute introduction or five minutes to introduce this to somebody. Um, here's an example of what you could share with them if they prefer to read an article versus if they prefer to listen to a podcast versus if they prefer to 
listen to a video, view a video. And similarly, if they've got an hour, here are the resources which we would go to. Because there are so many great resources already available, but it does take time again to go through and start looking at what's available on the MapCamp Slack community. Um, I think there's also the, um, there's a community forum as well, for example, plus all of the videos on YouTube. Um, so there are so many great resources already, and even um, the Learn Mapping, the Learn Wardley Mapping course as well by Ben. It's sometimes that can be a bit bewildering and just knowing having a guide about where to direct new people to this especially being cognizant of people's um attention span i think that would help so possibly a, spread a series of quick start guides yeah industry specific uh, if it was industry specific i think that would be brilliant um and because that was my other piece that i was going to just bring up what I find very valuable from the book was actually being able to see more and more examples worked through. But equally, I had time and I had a sufficient motivation to invest that time to read through the book, especially because my CEO was going through it. How can we make some more of these examples and case studies quickly and readily accessible to people who who maybe have not yet got to the point where they feel I want to invest a lot of time into this because let's be honest like people always come across new framework new approaches to doing things so it's about finding the ways to have those little nuggets which get people interested and exciting enough to invest a little bit more time and then as they start going deeper into this I think they will have the similar process which I had where you start thinking I wish I had applied, I wish I had applied this in the past. And once you get people to that point, I think then Wardley mapping can become really embedded within that individual. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I mean, these recorded conversations are a kind of start to try and do that. But people have made comments in the past that talking heads for an hour is time consuming mm -hmm. and uh you know to be able to condense that somehow maybe we're heading in that direction it's just how how do we execute it in a way that uh that really works yep. so if anybody wants to take up Rakesh's challenge <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome so i think i'd like to wrap up now because there's a lot in it in this conversation and I really would like to take it offline and encourage mm -hmm. others to join in. So um, if people want to stay in tune with you, Rikesh, are you on social media? <laughs> I'm quite bad on social media, <laughs> but yeah. I quite I, slack on the other hand, I am very accessible on, which is like okay. the way I'd definitely recommend well, getting hold of me. I'll grab your links and we'll share them in the, yep. in the description. So at this point, I'd like to thank Chris Daniels for joining me today, but a big thank you to you, Vikesh, for taking the time to be with us and to share those really interesting maps. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Vikesh. Bye. Bye. Bye.